Hello, my name is Mariana. I am the Development and Communications Coordinator at NIJO, and we are here today to talk to three amazing guests, Emily, Sarah and Elena, who I will introduce in a minute, about women and UK jazz as part of NIJO's International Women's Day celebrations. Um, this conversation is happening off the back of a brilliant report written by Emily and Sarah about the challenges faced by female musicians specifically in the UK jazz scene. So I will start by going around and introducing our guests and ask them to say just a few words about themselves. So first off, we have Sarah Rain. Welcome, Sarah. Um, if you wouldn't mind just saying a few words about yourself and about the report that brought us here. So I'm Sarah Rain. Um, I currently work at Edinburgh Napier University uh, as a research fellow. Um, this project was done in partnership with Cheltenham Jazz Festival and with Emily as the um, industry partner and it was released I think two months ago now. The report's about 44 page report and it brings together all the different findings which were uh, the gender data from um, Cheltenham Festival but also three other festivals um, and some interviews with um, musicians, women musicians who were playing at the festival that year so that was 2019. And um, we've had a really great response so far and I'm looking forward to talking to everyone about it. Brilliant, thank you so much, Sarah, and welcome. Um, next up, we have Emily Jones. Um, Emily, welcome. Uh, would you mind telling us a little bit about what you do and why do you think it is important to have these conversations? Sure, um, yeah, so I'm Emily. I am currently a senior producer for artist development and projects at Sage Gateshead a Music Centre in the Northeast. Um, I've been there for about 18 months and prior to that I was head of programming for Cheltenham Jazz Festival so I worked with Sarah on the report that she mentioned um, which came about after we signed up for the Key Change Pledge and had some interesting conversations with one of Sarah's colleagues about research around that. Um, I'm also a board member for the Jazz Promotion Network uh, which sort of represents jazz in the UK and Ireland as an industry. Um, and uh, I'm also a musician, although not so much nowadays. <laughs> um, but to answer your question about, about why it's really important that we're talking about this stuff and, and why I think it's really important that the research happened, um, I think there have been a lot of conversations, partly sparked by the Key Change Pledge about gender balance in the wider music industry. And I think there are some issues that are specific to jazz. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it was really important to, to have this report um i mean there are some things in the report which do apply across the whole of the music scene um but there are also particular things within jazz that need to be talked about uh, and discussed and you, i think you do find that within kind of what might be referred to as like niche genres that sometimes you kind of find things work slightly differently or they might be slightly behind the curve in some areas as well so it was just really important to try and push push for some change i think or at least raise awareness Thank you so much, Emily, and hard agree on that. Um, last but not least, we have Elena De Bono. Um, Elena, would you um, get to tell us about your involvement with Nigel along the years and why do you think it's good to share these topics with our young audiences in particular? Yeah, um, my name is Helena De Bono and I am a jazz singer songwriter. Um, I went to Leeds College of Music. I left there in 2018, I think, 2018, so a few years ago now, and then moved back. Um, I'm from London originally, so moved back and joined Nigel. Um, I was the singer with Nigel for two years and now I am teaching the singers at Nigel Academy. Um, I think it's so important. It's just such an, uns for me, it's been such an unsaid topic, my whole musical education, you know, and I feel when I was at college, there were so many girls um, or females doing the classical course, or maybe even the pop courses, but not necessarily the jazz course. And it was always a big question that I had, you know, why is this a thing? And I think and then continuing, I thought maybe it was just Leeds, so they didn't have many girls. But then I came back to London and saw it was actually the whole the whole jazz scene, I guess. So yeah, I think it's so important. And I think especially for the future generations to see female faces at the forefront, you know, so they have someone who they can relate to. Yeah. Thank you so much, Elena. And I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, I think to kickstart, I think it is important to note, as we all touched on a little bit, that while the report's findings, and that is that female jazz musicians do face gender-based discrimination, widespread gender-based discrimination. While they're a bit shocking, they're not really surprising, are they? Um, Emily, do you want to comment on that? 
Uh, yes, I would like to comment on that because uh, I I know what you mean. And I think if you've been involved with jazz for a long time, it's easy to sort of think, well, yeah, obviously this is, this is self-evident. We all know this. We're not surprised by this. But actually, it's really important that we do try and feel surprised by it. And if you perceive it with the outside eye, you can see how wrong it is. Um, it just shouldn't be like that. I mean, I mean, for me personally, when, when Sarah's sort of early findings started to come through, the, the, the statistic about, about sexual harassment was particularly shocking because you kind of, to some extent, you sort of assume that thing kind of thing might happen on a certain level, but to actually see it, see these things in black and white in writing really rams at home, I think. Um, and someone in another conversation I was in recently said, you know, we shouldn't be going, oh yeah, we know that 90% of women are facing discrimination. That's terrible. That's really terrible. So we should be surprised by it, I think. That's, that's my opinion. Absolutely, you're right. There's also something different um, about having anecdotal evidence, even if it comes from everyone you know, uh, and seeing it empirical evidence written on a report. There's something more official about it. Uh, Elena, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think for me, I was definitely I was definitely taken aback by this by the statistic, and I think because I mean, I, um, being part of the scene, I've never really spoken to people about it, you know, and always if I have experienced discrimination or anything, you know, I've always kind of thought, oh, you know, I'll just leave it. I don't want to create a fuss, you know, I don't want to say anything, and I think that's a big thing that a lot of females on the scene do have because they want to be seen to be the same as um, their male colleagues, you know, and they don't want to be the female who's caused an issue. So I think, it, you know, for me, I was shocked. And I think, you know, I've experienced a lot of um, gender based discrimination, you know, just being the pretty face at the front of the band or something, you know, things like that. So yeah, I think it's so important that it's discussed. Thank you. Sarah, how has the reaction been to the report? Has it been shock and surprise? Or has it just been, there we go, there's proof now? Um, I think there's a mix. Um, I'm most interested in the way that musicians have responded. And it's I'm really pleased to say that it's brought everybody together and it started quite difficult conversations. And it's actually brought different musicians from different genres, primarily jazz, but also across the UK to talk about their sort of regional experiences. And when Emily put the, some, some of the stats on Instagram, it was interesting to see that it generated a lot of discussion amongst Scottish jazz musicians, because there is a big um, gender imbalance in that scene. So that's, that's for me has been like the most important thing. I think it's been, um, in terms of like Twitter and stuff, it's been retweeted by quite influential organizations and uh, music bodies. So I'm really pleased that people are reading it. It's an open access report, so everyone can go online and, and find it um, and download it and share it. So I think for me, it being shared and people having these conversations is the most important part of this. And that's gone really well so far. Thank you. And we will also uh, be sharing the report as a link as we share this conversation too. There are two um, sort of statistics that kind of stick out to me in the report. So. 90% of the interviewees said that they have faced gender-based discrimination. 30% said that they had faced sexual harassment. Um, could you give us a sense of what, what is the scope of these, um, of these conversations? So I guess um, it's, it's sort of useful to relate back to the, the previous um, question that you asked um, Eleanor and um, Emily, because I came into this as an anthropologist rather than a jazz specialist. So I was actually really shocked. Um, and also um, it helped to anonymize these res these responses. So it's it, I wanted to get some statistical evidence, um, some data, but also some experiences, which is how this this quite scary stat came out and um, to listen to people's responses and um, in sort of quite depth because they were people were going to quite quite detailed um, explanations of what happened to them that that was quite shocking um, and there are things that are quite um, sort of surface and every day um, which when they accumulate are really damaging so not having dressing rooms not being able to um, have a dressing room change in and I think that's a really common experience for a lot of musicians um, I'm sure beyond jazz and and that sort of professionalism is and and is um, a real problem having like a quite a mixed band and then not having your own dressing room is, is hard 
and then you have things like um, I spoke to this is something that I brought to Emily which she was able to resolve really quickly but um, male technicians asking women musicians if they could use their own equipment and this apparently is a very common thing as well um, so these there's these small things that are happening all the time which are really damaging to your confidence and to your engagement with the jazz scene but then you also have these big things um, so we had a, a, an example of of where someone had been told to sex up their album cover, which is really frustrating um, to hear as a woman, and it must have been really damaging for that for that one musician to to have to th to think about. And then they had the um, someone was um, had an unwanted sexual advance from a, a venue owner, and that's a real problem in terms of like you know gender politics, but also this the the hierarchy of the scene, and it's just those things you shouldn't be they shouldn't be happening and um, they were, those things happened less, um, but it was quite awful to listen to them. And this is only a sample of 10 people. But I think that having spoken to a lot of different women over the last couple of years, these things do happen quite regularly. Yeah, I, I think unfortunately they do. Thank you, Sarah. Emily, is there anything that you would like to add to that? Um. I think I think Sarah's kind of yeah given a good <laughs> a good scattering of uh, some of the the issues that were faced. Um, I think particularly um, relating to a comment that Elena made earlier around around people not wanting to cause a fuss or cause a scene. I think it's it sh it highlights how important it is that that this kind of research is happening because these issues wouldn't be brought to light otherwise. Um, and, uh, you know, as someone who was running a festival at the time, for example, the example, the, the question around the way that technicians treat female artists um, was something that, that, you know, we had not necessarily perceived to be an issue. You know, we, you know, the festival works with a large number of freelance technical crew and um, we, you know, believe they're all good people, all good at the job. You know, we enjoy working with them, but who knows what gets said unthinkingly um, in the in the, you know in the fast that fast paced environment, um, so it's really uh, really important for for kind of the industry to become aware of those sort of things, and they wouldn't get spoken about unless that they you know the artists are able to talk about them anon anonymously in that kind of forum. Um, so I think it just underlines how useful this kind of work can be, um, and and that you know across across the jazz scene, everyone should be taking note of some of these issues and thinking what can I do about them. Yeah, absolutely. I think to pick up on something you said, um, Elena, you were nodding, I don't know if enthusiastically or, or furiously, uh, while Sarah <laughs> recounted some of the accounts told to her by the interviewees. Uh, do you think there's a sort of safety in numbers? Is there, do you think people are more likely to come forward with their own experiences when things like this exist already as the baseline? Yeah, I definitely do. I think it creates such a space, a safe space. And also it's like having that that um, vulnerability, you know, once you know that somebody else has been vulnerable about their personal experience, it kind of encourages you to also stand in solidarity with the other female musicians on the scene. And that's definitely how I've felt, you know, since especially since reading um, your the report, you know, and I think women in general are always told, and this is a conversation I have a lot with my with my friends, women are always told, like, don't take up space, you know, make yourself smaller, like shrink in the room, you know, whether that and that's in diet culture, that's every, you know, that's everywhere we go, we're told to be smaller. And I think that really impacts, you know, and especially them being told, you know, sex up your your album covers, like that's shocking, you know, you don't and then your male colleagues release an album cover that might just be a picture of a piano, it might not even have their face on it, it might not have anything on it, you know, but we're told, you know, wear something provocative or, you know, wear makeup, do this. And I think, especially with the, um, with the dressing room situation, you know, I've had, I've had that so many times where it's like, oh, we'll just leave the dressing room for you to get changed or no, it's okay, I'll just go to the toilet and like get changed there. And it's having that, it's such a strange environment to be in. And I think if, if it was in an office space, for example, that wouldn't, it wouldn't be allowed, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't, wouldn't slide at all. But because it's, you know, we're moving around, we're everywhere, we're going to different places, you know, it's a completely different, different situation. So I think it's so important that there's these reports out there just to start the conversation of it, you know. Thank you, Elena. Um, I think, yeah, it's also important to know that I think it's fair to say this is a broad social issue. 
But Emily, do you think there's anything specific to jazz that makes it more real so in that genre? Um, I think there are some things. I think I think Helena's just sort of touched on it a little bit, which I think is the working environment. Um, I mean, it, I guess it applies it applies to the music industry on a kind of wider scale, but I, I guess it's uh, particularly prominent in jazz, maybe because of the scale of the venues very often um, and the kind of the grassroots nature of the scene and things happening in jazz clubs and bars and pubs. Um, but the, the, you know, the working environment is based around a kind of very informal setting. Um, it's a setting which uh, in which alcohol is very prevalent. Um, Kind of you know, there's a very blurred line between friends and colleagues you know you know as you said in an office environment certain things are just not acceptable um and that 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 blur between friends and colleagues is really problematic i think particularly in terms of things like harassment um and you know an appropriate behavior in general um i think yeah there's a whole range of a whole range of issues i think it's quite it's quite a small scene on the whole which then heightens the issues around speaking out um uh, because you feel much more exposed um it's also, I don't want to kind of cast aspersions here, but there are definitely some people that have been working in the industry behind the scenes for a very long time um, and perhaps are not as receptive to change or to thinking differently or doing things differently. Um, I think yeah, there's a whole range of issues, some of which are specific to jazz, some of which are specific to music, really, um, that, that kind of make it particularly high risk, I guess, in that respect. Um, Sarah, do you uh, would you have any comments on that based on your past experience doing similar studies? So this is this is quite a, a short um, project, and when I started trying to unpick it, I realised how complicated this the gendering of jazz is, um, and in terms of what we consider to be jazz, what we teach, um, you know, students, but also the general public, what is jazz, and that's a very gendered history, and that's I think that's quite problematic. So I've been thinking about that as a researcher, how how we remember jazz, who's remembered, who's forgotten, and I think there's a lot of there's a lot of gaps there where women should have been. Um, and they're not given, and they may be talked about in a very different way. So if you think about um, the jazz singers, very famous jazz singers, they'll be talked about in a very particular way that they may, you know, they may not have spoken about jazz musicians like that. P parts of their personal lives, for example, are much more discussed, um, and parts of their problematic personal lives are discussed. Whereas they try, some um, writers try to gloss over that parts of of the jazz greats who are male. So I think there's already a problem there. And then once you get into a sort of formal educational um, environment, there's lots of issues there. There's in terms of um, the gender balance of staff and the gender balance of cohorts. And then also when you're when you're thinking about what people are being taught, so there's there's a gap there in 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 women coming through. And I was wondering, yeah, what Eleanor thought about that because maybe she's had a bit of experience doing that and also being a vocalist because one of the things I was looking at is how the vocalist is positioned and how they are valued and whether they're thought, you know whether they're thought of in a similar way as instrumentalists and there's a real there's a real thing going on there as well yeah i think that's such a big thing you know i think my experience as a singer is going to be completely different to the experience of you know a female saxophonist or a female trumpet player or a female drummer you know because i do think especially the roles in a big band, you know, if we're speaking about the roles in a big band, for example, are very much, they're very gendered, you know, the singer is the female at the front, you know, and I think that's shocking. I know when I was at, when I was at college, I think there were maybe three female, um, female members of staff. And like you're saying, you know, it's only been recently that I've been reflecting on my time at, in at conservatoires, actually all the musicians we were looking at were male, other than singers. You know, so of course, then, you know, for me as a singer, I'm going to see artists who I can relate to because they're also female. But, you know, if I was a saxophonist, who do I look to from the greats, like you're saying, you know? And um, yeah, I think that is that is so it's mind blowing for, to me, you know, that we don't have more of that. And we don't have more female educators at the forefront, um, especially at conservatoire level and even further back than that, you know, even at primary level, you know, it goes all the way back and I think you know all of the music teachers who I had growing up you know for piano it was always a male piano teacher you know but then for singing it was always a female female singing teacher and it's so yeah it's um it's a whole it goes it's so deep it's so deep rooted 
and you know talking you know when we talk about like sexual harassment you know it's all this you know and i saw a lot of in the report was all about people being um dropped by agents because they maybe already had a female and you know that has happened to me i've had that you know we, oh, we've already got a brunette a brunette jazz singer so we so you know we don't we don't need you on our on our books or oh you know you don't really i've had before this was a few years ago um doing a doing a band doing a function band and had the um you don't really look like the function that like this function singer we want mm, not really sure what what they mean and then the person who was replaced happened to be a very tall very thin very beautiful blonde girl you know and that and but that was and that was chosen by the agent you know and the fact that just being discriminated against because of the way you look not you know that, that's a whole other kettle of fish so yeah I can definitely relate to a lot of the things that were said I think there's also something which um I, should, uh, I was unsure if you were going to mention Sarah actually around around perhaps more so for instrumentalists around the nature of jam sessions and the competitive environment and that kind of um kind of you know it's the showing off sort of macho type thing which sometimes can deter a lot of a lot of women um which you know is something that's very specific to jazz um you don't really see that in other in other genres um and even, you know back when i was a student i sometimes felt a little bit uncomfortable in those kind of environments it's all about who can play faster and higher and uh, and and you know that may not be the approach that many women take to their music i don't know yeah i would sorry to i would agree with that completely i have so many um female musician friends and they would be like no not going to get up i don't want to expose myself like that because it is a case you know you see all these guys getting up playing so fast so loud like you're saying and you kind of just think oh no you know i i have that all the time as the singer i'm like i don't want to get up and even try and compete almost you know and you don't then want to be belittled by the things that they might say you know and i think especially like the spect skepticism within abilities that's so at the forefront between you know gender it's like oh well they're only here because they're the girl and you know we need you know we need a female in the band and i've definitely heard people say that before you know and that is it you know they're no that's not the case they're there because they deserve their place because they are fantastic musicians and it shouldn't you know people shouldn't that shouldn't be the first thought that comes into somebody's mind yeah it's also never the other way around right uh, people in positions of privilege are never asked if they're there because there has been centuries of privilege that got them there which could also be an interesting question um i think uh, this is a good segue to um ask Kind of what can be a difficult question because I know people have um, very different thoughts on it. But what would you say? Um, I guess Emily, I'll, I'll pick on you for this one. Uh, what would you say to people who um, who do have this view that this is tokenistic, that um, you know, injecting women in bands uh, or having uh, quotas for how many females you need to have in a specific festival or a specific lineup, that that is not a good way to address uh, gender imbalances. This gets me really riled up. <laughs> I've had this conversation several times. Um, in one case, several times with the same person, which is great. Um, <laughs> Sarah knows who I'm talking about. Um, yeah, I've had this conversation quite a lot, unsurprisingly. I think quite often when it comes to, to the idea of, of a quota in terms of festival programming, um, what I would always say about, for example, the key change pledge is that it's a target, not a quota. They're not the same thing. Um, it's very easy to see them as interchangeable ideas, but they're, they're not really. One is something you aim for and work towards, and one is something you just fulfill and then you stop. Um, uh, and I think the difference is important because if it's a target, quality is still really key. If it's a quota, it's like, well, it doesn't matter what we chuck in as long as we get there. Um, and that's that's been really important in terms of the way that I was thinking about the key change pledge when I was programming Cheltenham. It's kind of essentially what you're looking to do is widen the pool that you're selecting from. And if you do that, you will end up with a more balanced lineup naturally. That's that's kind of the idea behind it. So it's not it's not about, oh, let's go pick we need we need to take any of the women that approach us for shows because we need to fulfill this this number. And that means that in theory you're working towards a longer term change. And it also means that. Uh, because it's not a quota it's a target if you exceed it you could just keep going in theory um 
So yeah, that that is a question that I find quite fr frustrating. And I think also quite often in my experience where I've been presented with that argument, it's from people who don't really understand the nature of, of that, of, of programming a festival. Um, kind of, they sort of see it as like going shopping, which is not really, <laughs> Not really how it works like oh, I'll put I'll put these women in my basket and these men in my basket and there we go that's done um, <laughs> that's just not at all not at all how it is um, so yeah I, I find those kind of arguments quite frustrating but I also think uh, there is it's not the only approach um, I think if you really shy away from that way of working you may see change but it'll take a lot lot longer um, and I think we could all agree that, that there's been the same people dominating for long enough and it's about time there was some change um, and I think it also is it's also based on an assumption that um, that there are a limited like a finite number of opportunities quite often what's behind that argument is well the women are getting these gigs so the men aren't getting them and that's not fair um, so I think we all need to be aware that, that there are not a finite number of opportunities. There is enough to go around. <laughs> Just because women are getting booked doesn't mean that there aren't going to be gigs for those other men. It can, it can feel like the opposite when you're a musician because you feel like you are all competing for the same things. Um, but that's in reality not how it is, in my opinion, anyway. Thank you, Emily. Sarah, would you like to comment on that from your professional or personal experience? Um, I think for me, um, what's really, really important is that Key Change is created and, and organisations like Key Change have, organ have created a platform for discussing these issues and for addressing them, thinking about them carefully. Um, and I think for people who are just coming into the jazz scene and who are, who are students and who are thinking about having you know, a job, a profession, a career within this scene, all these problems might be off-putting. But I think it's brilliant that we're having these conversations now and that we're sharing data like this. And it isn't something you don't talk about anymore because you don't, you're worried about not getting a gig or you're worried about upsetting a very small amount, you know, all these people, this very small scene. We're, we're talking about it. The, this is the good thing about key change. There is an issue. We're gonna, we're gonna try and resolve it. It's very complex, but it, it's ha about having those conversations. And that's the best thing I think about key change. If we, if we really focus on that, and because this sort, this sort of conversation might be quite scary to someone who's new to jazz and who's a, who's a younger student, but I think it's brilliant that, that this is happening and this should be seen as a really positive, positive point. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Elena, I wanted to ask you, because obviously you have been involved with Nigel uh, for, quite, for quite a long time now, uh, and as a jazz educator yourself at the moment, what is the role of organisations like ourselves and of educators like you in making sure that this doesn't continue indefinitely onto the future? I think it is the educators, I think it is key for educators to have a diverse programme. What we are teaching are the future generation of jazz. You know, we can't just be teaching the music of males of white males you know we have to make everything diverse you know and whether that when I, I really agree with what you're saying about quotas and targets you know and I think that's such a big thing we can't you know having filling a quota then of course that's going to make it tokenistic for people but by saying you know I I aim to do this you know we aim at this point to have this it will just encourage more and more people so for me you know I know in my vocal classes I always pick a range of songs and we speak about the history of them as well. So whether, why they were sung by this artist or why by this and why by this person, why this, who wrote the song? Why did they write the song? Thinking about the social, cultural, historical, and a lot of jazz as well. The lyrics in themselves are is, is from a different time. You know, you wouldn't hear a lot of those lyrics being written today. And a lot of the songs I choose not to sing because of the, the sexist connotations behind, behind the lyric, you know? So I think, as educators, it's so important to make sure, and especially, um, I don't know how to phrase this, but for people to be able to see that it is an accepting um, community of people. You know, um, if you're an educator, let's say a male educator, making sure that the females in your group also feel seen and heard, you know, and I think that's a big thing as well to help that move forward, especially when it gets to jam levels, going to jams, making sure that people do feel seen and heard. I hope that kind of answers. Question, I'm not really sure. Yeah, on um, on the pledge for 50-50 uh, gender balance as well, I remember I went to Primavera in Barcelona in 2019 
and they have um, they had uh, a 50 50 lineup. And it was amazing because you could you could see it. It was something that was noticeable. So it kind of made me think, why couldn't I notice before that there weren't any women? It's only noticeable that there are. Um, I don't know if anyone else has anything uh, to add that you think is important to be included in this conversation. Um, now is the time. I was just going to mention actually on that that point about visibility and, and noticing it that um, I think it was in the second year of Cheltenham sort of having been signed up to the key change pledge in our um, anonymous customer feedback there was a comment which said great festival too many women. <laughs> Which I, I saw that as a mark of success. I was like, that means someone has noticed that there are more women than normal. <laughs> it means we've done something right. So yeah, I think I think you're right. I think the, the more visible it becomes, the more role models there are, and and the more it becomes normalised rather than the way it is currently normalised, which is the other way around. I think um, one one more point on the education kind of stance. Um, you know, as children, you're always you know young girls are always told. Don't, don't don't make mistakes everything's got to be perfect so i think maybe that's a big thing why there's maybe more classical music classical female classical musicians because it is just you know reading what is there and there's a right and a wrong whereas with jazz being wrong is right almost you know so i think that's almost what scares um people off i know for me improvising still i'm like oh you know it really freaks me out and I think that's because I was always told make sure you sing the phrases as written and I was always trained classically so I think a lot of that links to all the way back when when children first pick up their instruments you know it's almost like gender is put you're pushed to certain genre by what by your gender or even instruments you know even instruments I know for me I was told oh you know you're going to play piano you're not going to play the drums you know so it's definitely a um goes all the way back which and I think you know research like this is so important like you're saying just to get the to get the conversation started between musicians from all genres you know from every genre because it isn't every genre and also from you know all walks of life for the audiences as well to see and to be able to also support female musicians female jazz musicians you know to be able to think oh actually i'm going to choose to go to that gig not that gig to support this i think that's so important especially like you're saying at festivals as well when you've got a lineup and so many different stages and deciding as a, as an audience which who am I going to go see you know it's making those informed decisions as well thinking actually I am going to give this a go today because I might not have gone to see a female trumpet player before you know so I think that's really important I think um, I'd like to just and I know this is maybe a, an assumed thing but this is not just a problem for women women musicians or women in jazz this is a problem for everybody and once I started having conversations with musicians they said well I went and I had a conversation with my band who's all male in the pub and they were really shocked to hear that I felt like this and I'd had these experiences so I think it, it's everyone's problem and we should all be discussing it and thinking about how we make people who we work with feel comfortable and be able to do their job because that's really what we're talking about here is someone being able to have a career and be professional and be treated as such. Yeah absolutely I think we too often ask the quote unquote victims to explain everything to everyone as if it's their problem that they're being oppressed uh, to begin with. Um, you all have been incredibly generous with your time. I think it is time to wrap up. Uh, if no one else has any thoughts, otherwise, please, um, you're more than welcome to share anything with us. Um, in that case, I just wanted to let everyone know that Nigel is going back to Ronnie Scott's this month. Uh, we are live streaming gigs from the club. And the first one is actually this Sunday with Elena as our first guest artist, uh, so we are really excited for that. I will put also the link to that uh, below. Uh, Sarah and Emily, is there anything you want to plug, anything you're working on that you want people to know about? No? I think, I think there are some things in the pipeline, but we're perhaps not quite at the point of speaking about them yet, unless you wanted to say something, Sarah. Well, we do sort of, but it's a little bit academic. So we're doing, um, <laughs> which will come out in the summer which is on access and diversity and festivals um so that's at jazz research journal so if you're interested in in issues of, of diversity and how 
how festivals are dealing with it. Emily and I are guest editing that, so it should be out in the summer. So I guess that's a good thing to plug. <laughs> We've sort of put it at the back of our heads, but it's there. We're doing it. <laughs> Definitely. Do send it our way so we can share it with our audiences as well when it's out. Um, Elena, anything you want to say? No, I just want to say thank you. Thank you both so much for starting this conversation that, you know, needs to needs to be happening. Yeah. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you from me too for being here today and for your brilliant work.